something doesn't work quite right, we change it. And we also do this for uh, our pollinator garden as well as our vegetable garden. And our permaculture journey, our permaculture journey is, the word permaculture is very important to us. It's a big part of what we do. It's, it's a holistic approach. It's a systems wide look at gardening and in concert and connected with the natural world and environment around us. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about the topics on the left. I just want to point out here that we live in zone 8B, Pacific Northwest, and we have a, a deep contrast in different types of the season. You can see the winter snow, which comes in. Temperatures at our elevation of about 1,150 feet can easily dip into the 20s. But yet in the summertime, it's, it can be hot and dry. And uh, so we have to make sure the plants that uh, we do choose are going to best fit that zone. On the uh, Picture on the right, you can see Bombus Vostasensky, also known as yellow faced bumblebee, which is most common in the Pacific Northwest, and we see quite a few visits by that bee. Next slide. This is an aerial view of the project. And if you look at the four squares that, that was originally, um, we bought all four um, pieces at all four lots, and we sold the westernmost one on the left. So we, we maintained the last three on the right. And a couple of features about this property, if you look at the black line, that's an old forest road that used to go through there that was used by the loggers when they logged the area. And then the blue line is going across the property is, an artesian, uh, is the creek from an artesian spring that bubbles up through the rocks, which is circled by the red. So you can see right on the board of our property that uh, artesian spring comes up from the rocks, follows down the creek, and that creek is designated by the county as a creek habit, as a, a creek, fish creek is what they actually call it. You might also be able to read the contour lines there. It gets really steep as you work your way from the uh, east to the west. And the stream flows pretty good certain times of the year. We also built two homes. The one we live in is the third lot over from the left. And then we built a daughter's home on the last lot. We were very careful in our selection of home sites. We wanted to make sure we took minimum amount of trees. And when we did take the trees down, actually only three, we had them milled and used them for construction of the barn. The green align is actually the new easement we put in to get to the homes. And so everything else, and especially in the second lot, was is left perfectly native. The last thing to note on this property is the only road access point that touches this property or comes near it is where the green line enters the property. Everybody else is five acres or 10 acres or more, backs up into ours. So it's like a mini wildlife sanctuary back here. There's no loud noise disturbances or no traffic going by and such. And we really enjoy it. Next slide. This is the setting then in uh, the days when we first bought the property, which goes about eight years ago. You can see that we're starting to do some of the uh, stone wall construction, which will eventually become flower beds. And the, the land was logged uh, some say 50 to 70 years ago, but the point is, is the practices weren't very good in those days. And what they had done, they just kind of threw and came through and cut and slashed and left the stumps wherever they were and didn't replant. So this, the pile of stumps you can see on the insert over there on the far right has now become habitat for the Douglas squirrel and Townsend chipmunk. And as also a lot of uh, snowberry has grown up in there, which we leave. I haven't seen them eat the snowberry berries, but they certainly use it for habitat and protection. And it's a really amazing little ecosystem on its own. There was some litter in the, on the 30 acres originally that we had, it was 21.5, but mostly all well, it was was logger camps that had just, you know, had fires and broken glass and stuff. And it was actually quite easy to remove. And I went around the entire property and make sure I got all the litter out. Then we've had, just because of the poor practices back in those days, we had just a whole slug of blackberry and invasive hollies. Now the blackberries were so thick in some areas that they, the uh, young new conifers couldn't make their way up through them. So I have been taking those out carefully over the last eight years. And some, in some cases by hand to dig the roots up to not to disturb the surrounding native uh, shrubs and bushes and trees and so forth. And I I've, I've reckon we've rescued hundreds and hundreds of young trees trying to make their way up to that thick uh, blackberries. 
Next slide. So this is the setting now. This is some of the things that have taken place since we started planting about seven, eight years ago. The number one thing is, is we, we went to the county and we uh, developed a plan and, and now we're reforesting according to that plan. And that plan is also, also a forest deferment for taxes. So it's kind of a win-win for the county and a win for us. The county gets trees saved and we uh, get to uh, have a much lower taxes on the lots. Now the second lot that I pointed out earlier is the one where the taxes really came down about 95%. If you have a house on there, it's not quite as good. The blackberry and holly removal will always be a work in progress. It's amazing how well they grow, but we did, we did leave some of the blackberries where we collected up the stumps and put them into a big pile because a lot of the little critters do eat them, especially the chipmunks and so forth. So, and, and we do as well. So I've left some of the blackberries out there. All the litter's gone and we removed the culvert from the creek that I talked about a little bit earlier. Actually, I meant to say in the previous slide that where the creek passes the old loggers road, there was a culvert put in and we'll talk just a little bit more about that. We did build the two home sites on uh, less than an acre each. And uh, I think I talked about, we stacked the stumps up, but we did not burn them. That was one of our big points. Uh, we tried to burn very little uh, property, very little on this property as we were developing it. And it turned out to be successful. And the, stump, and the stack stumps really are providing great habitat for animals. I, one of these things in the picture in the lower right, you can see one of my favorite, it's the blossom for the bunchberry where the sword fern is actually in there. That provides great habitat. I've seen some of the uh, chipmunks run in and out of there. And, and when the berry, when it does eventually fruit, that also provides a source of food. If you look really carefully, you can see some of the black scallop and so forth is the ground cover. And in the background, you can see some uh, snowberry that we've left there and it grows very well up here, my guess in most gardens. Uh, up in the upper uh, picture, you can see some of the bee balm, which is very uh, fragrant and uh, one of my favorite plants, and it's heavily um, populated by uh, pollinators. Next slide. So uh, when, I saw, when I showed the arterial, when the creek was passing on the old log, logging road, they put in this culvert back then, and once again, practices weren't uh, all that hot in terms of the environment. So in the left uh, photo, you can see the culvert kind of buried by some of the ferns. Now in high water, which happens in um, early spring, late winter, that water can be over the culvert. In the low period, which happens in late summer, it can be a few inches below the culvert. So it fluctuates quite a bit, but we, we definitely didn't want it in there. It wasn't a natural part of the environment. So we contacted the county and the Clark County Conservation District came out and they said, yep, this is a great project. In fact, we're so excited about it that what we'll do is we'll put you on the priority list, mostly because we didn't want anything to replace it. A lot of people who apply for their conservation program to have old culverts removed also want a bridge put over. So we got done, we got prioritized. We, the work started the next year. And I will tell you that uh, no federal agencies, but just about every county and state agency you can imagine came out here to take a look at this. The, the botanists, the uh, foresters, um, water management folks and so forth. So I did a lot of tours down there and they were, in, they were quite excited that we were taking this out. If you look in the very upper where the bucket of water is, that was 20 some um, steelhead trout that were removed. Now I realize those are very small fish. But if you work your way down a little bit down the creek uh, towards the end of the property line, they got much bigger. Uh, we, we found one that was about eight, nine inches, so uh, in a much, much healthier size. And the upper right corner, you can see some of the heavy equipment was down there. Now, the reality is I could have gone down with my tractor and ripped this thing out and you know, be done with it in, in two, two days. But the project, you can't do that because you can't do any construction work or log cutting within 200 th feet of a stream, creek bearing stream. And now I believe it's changed to 300 feet. So we went around the right process, county came in. Um, it got to be quite expensive and quite time consuming, but I have to admit they did a really good job. If you look at the uh, picture in the lower right, that's the cr uh, creek restored after the culvert was removed. And they came in and they actually put a bunch of dead snags down there. 
and so forth. And then the inset picture is the Cope's giant salamander. And the uh, biologists were very excited to find this. It's, it is only uh, a native species salamander of the Pacific Northwest. And it's got some uh, unusual characteristics. So we carefully put it downstream as we did all the steelhead. And we just had to assume, we assumed that they lived out their life happily from there. The project was very successful. And um, we, I went down there with the conservation district and planted 30 Western red cedars and a few other uh, species that do well in uh, wetlands. You can see them there a little bit on the left, on, excuse me, on the right, lower right. Next slide, please. So um, we have two types of gardens. We have one is the pollinator garden, the other one we call the people garden. One of the uh, we, we want to dedicate as much of this property we, we could as to wildlife. And part of that is a 10,000 square feet garden, pollinator garden, specifically for winged invertebrates. And we everybody's welcome, but you might know that the honeybee is not native to the US. It was, it was brought over in the early days. Uh, some of the pollinators that are very good in the Pacific Northwest are like the mason bee and so forth. We're, that's really who we're trying to attract. We also follow the very simple Xerces guidelines. You might know the Xerces um, Society. They're an international nonprofit organization that's absolutely dedicated to um, invertebrates. And they, surprisingly, their main office is right down in Portland, which I visited one time. A couple of things I want to point out about these pictures. If you look at the one on the very uh, left, that's, um, you might recognize that as Snowberry. In fact, it's coming up right now as we speak. And that's one of the very early bloomers for the pollinators. Um, and then if you look on the picture in the upper right corner, you can see some of the, uh, I'm sorry, in the center up, you can see some of the sedums, which will uh, start to bloom. They've got white tops now. They will start to bloom sometime in late August and carry through to September, right next to the black-eyed Susan. You can also look in the upper uh, picture in the upper right, you can see some of the ground covers. We have both geranium and then we have cushion plant up here. We use a lot of ground cover. It's good for insect habitat, but also it really helps with evaporation and so forth. Now the Xerxes, the Xerxes guidelines say really three simple things. We want something blooming as much of the year as you can. You want natives or native compatibles, and you want to group flowers together. So that's what we did. And uh, between the winter jasmine, the snowdrops, and the late fall sedums. We have something out here as much as we can. And we also group the plants together. I guess it turns out when the pollinator comes in, they don't want to rediscover something plant to plant. So groups of plants are, are the best you can do. And that's what we did. Next slide. This is a, another part of our big part of our pollinator garden was that we, we specifically tailor to moss and butterflies. A lot of people think the wing invertebrates they're always talking about bees but you know uh, even though the pacific northwest is not really known for its butterflies like the midwest for instance we do have our species out here and some of the plants that i found that are best for those are like in the upper right corner the joe pie weed that um it was when i was in the master gardener training program and somebody just casually mentioned how much they enjoyed the joe pie weed i never really heard of it so and I can see why it's a magnificent plant. It, uh, I've seen butterflies, swallowtails on it all the time and bees as well. And if you look at the picture on the left, this is our pride and joy. We had a monarch visit us. We didn't think it would happen, but it did. The Western migration route, not to be confused with the Midwestern migration route is, was thought to be going extinct a couple of years ago, but the last two years have actually had a bit of a rebound. We don't, uh, the scientists don't know exactly why that is, but it certainly is good news. And Lisa and I are also part of the Monarch Watch Program and Wayward Station. So this at this Wayward Station that we created for the, the Monarchs, one came by, took a photo, got on the registry list, uh, and sent it in. And we got uh, we got um, we have now have one Monarch on our property. I was hoping there was more. I couldn't see more, but it was kind of exciting for us. I never thought it would happen. Uh, anybody who's really, really good at identifying milkweed may see the uh, swamp milkweed, um, Asclepias incarnata. I'm not sure if that's what it is or if it's butterfly weed, uh, tuberosa. The plant that I bought said tuberosa, but if you do, my research says that looks more like swamp milkweed. So I'm happy to hear anybody that might think it's different. Uh, 
You can also see the checkered white, which we get a lot of butterflies that visit a lot of the different asters as well as the Joe Pye weed. Next slide, please. One thing we've done is we've put in a lot of uh, logs and rocks for what we call the beneficial, beneficial insect. Now, personally, I, I think all insects are beneficial, but there are some that are considered pests, especially when they get into your vegetable crop. But I have found, even though we don't use pesticides or insecticides, in fact, we don't use sides of any type here. Everything is hand weeded or uh, fertilized with compost that we do on the project ourselves. But one thing I have found is that these um, rocks and logs, especially when they're mixed together and their log has good contact with the earth, that has reduced the amount of leaf damage we have from aphids, aphids and so forth. There are a lot of beneficial beetles and so forth that live in that habitat. On the right, and the, the photos themselves have changed over the years, but I just wanted to make the point of the, of the rock formation with the creeping time. Uh, that's quite a bit bigger than that this year, but it's, it, my point here was to just show the different types of rocks. And then on the left, that's a, a moth garden specifically planted. Uh, some of the flowers you may be interested in are things like moonflower or four o'clocks or so forth. But really it turns out that moths visit as many uh, plants as the butterflies do, as long as they have a nice landing plant, pad like yarrow, for instance, it's really good. If the plant closes up at night, then clearly they're not beneficial to a moth, but <clears throat> they do visit very much the similar plants. Uh, and, and behind that moth garden is a rock and log combination that all kinds of little critters are constantly crawling in and out of, including the chipmunks. Next slide. Under the, under the people garden. So Lisa and I have um, built this and we have a greenhouse that does really good for off season, especially winter spinach and we can grow, uh, it grows really well. One of the things about this property is we are starved <clears throat> for sun. So uh, placement of things are very important. And I, I would often say I'd rather go through a world war than cut a tree down. You know, it's even hard to, for me to prune them. So, but th we do have some locations that we do get the suns and the greenhouse happens to get one of those. Now, if you look at the picture in the upper corner on the right, you can see the, um, what, some of the raised beds. Now our raised beds here are built to ADA standards, which is the American Disabilities Act. Lisa has multiple sclerosis, so her mobility is limited. And we had, we had to build these raised, raised beds to meet those standards. Someday we, she may be less mobile. And we use juniper wood. I just want to make a plug for juniper wood. It is an amazing, sustainable lumber that, that requires no um, stain or any type of preserver on it. I try not to promote cedar. One is it only lasts half as long, and I don't really consider it a sustainable lumber. Now, it turns out that juniper is in the central of Oregon is harvested in a very responsible way and it's sold to by a company in Portland. It is a bit, little bit more expensive, but it lasts twice as long. And so it does offset the cost in that way. You might wanna look at some of the vegetable beds and you can see in the foreground in the picture in the upper left and the upper right corner, uh, nasturtium is in there. And so what we call that is compatibles. Raspberries and nasturtium are very compatible plants. And so we put those in there together. They don't grow as tall as the raspberries, so the raspberries can still be easily harvested. But what they do do is they provide a great cover for evaporation. And they also look nice. And they also provide other things for pollinators. So it's kind of like a win-win. This is one of the, uh, the areas that we did put a deer fence around. When Lisa and I first started developing the property, we kind of decided that all critters would be welcome. We realized that everybody would take their share. I do have to admit the moles are getting on my nerves a little bit because they're so destructive. And this year happens to be a, seeing a boom of them. But with the vegetable garden, the deer just came in and decimated. So do the chickens. So we did put a deer fence around it. You can see inside the greenhouse there and outside. Outside the greenhouse, I planted a bunch of compatibles um, and just pollinator plants as well. 
and we grow several vegetables uh, and roots, including potatoes and so forth. And we have a pretty successful year. One thing we don't do well up here is the sun soaking up pumpkins and things like that, but we still keep trying. If you look at the photograph on the lower right, you can see the boxed squares. There's five of them with a stone in there. This is one of the, I was gonna write a book on lessons not lessons learned by a master gardener, but it got so big I gave up. This is one of the lessons learned. That was, that was originally for herbs and mints, but I planted two mints and several herbs in there for Lisa with our limited mobility. And by the end of the summer, we only had one mint. It was so aggressive, it took over. So what I did is I separated everything into squares and those actually, they go down quite deep there because the mint roots were so aggressive. And it works really well. I will say that um, the deer love that little section in there, but we managed to get our share out of it. Next slide, please. So uh, what's going on here? The, another thing about people gardens is if you, the picture on the uh, right is the, what I call their uh, test beds. I wanted to do um, several different types of plants in there. And uh, I wanted bear grass and I wanted Indian paintbrush just because they're really nice plants. And if you go, I mean, just, you know, 10 miles from here is uh, Silver Star Mountain. And up there, the wildflowers are <clears throat> bear grass and Indian paintbrush are just, um, they're unbelievable. But they seem to grow within a, with a bandwidth. So I thought we'd take our luck down here. After all, we are at 1,150 feet, but I just couldn't get anything to grow. It, it doesn't mean that I didn't try or that we don't keep trying different things. But in our, in my test garden here, uh, it's, it's things that I would like to see difficult to grow and I have success stories and, and not so successful stories. Now the broadleaf milkweed is what I'm trying to grow in there now. It is not a native species. Um, there really is only one species of milkweed that does really well in this area, the narrow leaf milkweed, uh, which we have plenty of. And the swamp and the common milkweed also do well, but they're in different sections of the garden from the monarch. So we continue on with test beds, see how things work and um, success and not so much success. On the picture on the upper left, you'll see what's, what's that all about? Well, it's, it's the stones that are separating also very aggressive weeds and rhizomes. So we do what we call rhizome management. There's some sorrel in there and a few, and some, uh, few other plants, but what you can see below these stones are uh, juniper scraps of juniper wood that went between them so the roots can't get between them and also the water I'm, I'm sorry the rocks formation acts as water retention everything here is about water retention um, it uses the minimum amount of water as we can so we'll, this was done about two years ago it's uh, we'll see how it goes if it works uh, great if not we'll try something else well I guess some of the fun about being a gardener is seeing what works and seeing what doesn't and then in the lower left, you'll see another pride and joy here. That's the lady fern. It's growing on a uh, rotten log under some soil. That took about three, three or four years to get to that point. But uh, we have five species of fern on property. I think I can name them all. Sword, maidenhair, deer, licorice, and lady fern. And um, most of those are easy to grow, except the lady fern was hard, but we finally got it to take. So, Next slide. Composting. If you look at the uh, upper right-hand photograph, you'll see our two about 10 foot by eight foot bins. And the bin on the left is compost, is material that was put in there comp last year. We both use carbon and nitrogen rich material. The carbon comes from the more of the dead stuff that we, um, like the, when I clean out the goat pens and the chicken pens, for, so I use that in there, hay that's uh, used as bedding. And then we also use, we cut, um, we don't have a lawn, I wanna make that point, <laughs> but what we do have is we have to cut the area perimeter around the yard so the house looks lived in. And in the photograph on the left, you can see an example of that. So the grass grows up, a lot, it's all non, mostly all non-native grass. I didn't plant a single grass seed, but it's, uh, we cut it so the home looks lived in. And I combine those two things in layers per all the directions you could read. And the compost, as again, in the bin on the left is, will be ready this spring. And then the bin that's on the right is where I've started next year's compost. 
uh, if I had to do it again, we're kind of limited for space up here. I would have built a third bin, bin because moving things back and forth, it gets a little tricky, even with the tractor. And a, a third bin would have certainly been helpful. And I may yet put one in, but I am limited in space there as well. On the photograph on the left, on the right uh, below, you'll see the deer eating the um, dandelions. And that's, that's actually the front of our house. And we let that go. We, we also cut a perimeter, like you can see in the other photograph. And that's what I use in the fall to, then, then, then in the fall, I, I do cut that with the tractor and use it for composting. I don't mind deer coming. Uh, I wish they would kind of keep out of the other plants, but this at least provides them some type of uh, nutrition. And I want to say that we, we don't, I'm very careful not to put evasives in the compost. And I learned my lesson. We had evening nightshade. I must have missed it or something. And the next thing I knew, I had an outbreak of it. It took me three years to get rid of it. But I didn't say weeds. And I specifically say that because weed is in the eye of the beholder. I, I think uh, a one of the um, stories I have is when we did the Clark County Natural Garden Tour, Somebody came out and said, oh my goodness, you know, there's a facilia. You want me to pick it real quick before somebody sees it? And my answer is no. Um, in fact, Lacey facilia, one of the two species, is the number one bee magnet in this garden. And I mean, it, the oregano is the close second, but everything else is a distant third. And I realized that uh, facilia is not that necessarily attractive of a plant, uh, it, but and it, it just goes like crazy if you're not careful, but it is easy to pull. So we leave the facility where it's at, let the bees do their thing with it. Another uh, plant that some people don't like is miner's lettuce and maybe bleeding heart and even some heal all. And, you know, I don't know if you know much about heal all, but it's a really good pollinator plant and it can easily grow in your, in your lawn and not be too um, obtrusive. So there's all kinds of plants you can use that help the pollinators and uh, are beneficial to everybody. We use, the, we use the compost mostly because it does take, it does uh, consist of chicken droppings and, and goat droppings, but we don't put any garden scraps in there other than plant-based. And so we use it for um, fruit bearing shrubs. We have raspberries and blueberries and so forth, and also for soil amendment. And it really does a good job. Sometimes they mix it down in the soil. Sometimes they just lay it on top and let the rain percolate it down through the soil. But it's like black gold. And the people who I give it to, some of my friends and so forth, it's they really they really say it's it's really good. So composting, you know, you can go on to the University of Washington and read tons of literature on how to compost. But I have found just when it quits steaming, turn it, and then in about nine months to a year, it's ready to go. Next slide. So Lisa and I enjoy a low carbon footprint. And if you look at the uh, barn on the upper right, you can see that's um, part of our solar um, panels. We have two, there's both residential and community. Now the residential is obvious, that's what you put on your property. But what's up with community? Well, Clark County, who's just very progressive in terms of solar and very good to work with, they opened up um, some of their sites on Patton Parkway where their main building is headquarters. And they put up several arrays and the public were allowed to buy shares of that. Well, we bought shares into that. And we also put up our residential. So total, we have almost 15,000 watts. That is enough to energize the house year round. Um, you, in Clark County, you want to design your house somewhere between about 100 and 105% or 95 and 105%. I won't go into the details, but um, it, it, you can't, you, uh, if you overgenerate, you get zeroed out on April 30th, so you don't want to overgenerate too much. If you look at the uh, lower left, you see the Tesla Power Wall. It's getting a lot of publicity this, nowadays. That works in conjunction with the solar and the grid. So if the grid were ever to go out, that transfer switch would automatically transfer us over. And so it's happened so quick, you almost don't know the power went out. And then it's charged by the solar panels while, while the power remains out. So we, um, if the power went out for several days and we use power judiciously, we could probably go on just about forever. If you look at the utility bill in the black box, you can see that we still have about $680 worth of credit in November. 
that's a lot for November. We shouldn't, we're, we're probably going to lose a lot of generation April 30th when a zero was out. But if you remember, we had an unusually dry and hot October. That's why we have so much credit. But as we generate, we get credits, uh, net, it's called net metering. And then April, come April 30th, if we have more leftover, it goes away. You can see Lisa is uh, proudly charging our electric car. A lot of you might say, well, electric cars, are they, can you still charge those off that grid? And the, and the answer is, it's been our experience. Your utility bill goes up about $25 a month if you have an electric car. And of course, with our solar, we need a few more watts maybe, but that will be with increased panel size. We also have limited truck use. Uh, we do have a diesel tractor, so we're not zero carbon. And we are transitioning our tools. I've got one left, one to go, all to gas, uh, all the battery power tools. Next slide. A rainwater collection, we do this in two different areas. One is for our raised beds. And um, I, want, I wrote an article for Grit Magazine if you want the exact details of uh, what we did here. Um, it's in the do-it-yourself section of Grit Magazine, or you can contact me, um, both for rainwater collection or any details you want to know on solar. Um, we put in 2,000 2, for a total of 4,000 gallons of storage. And the tank you can see in the upper right is one of the 2,000 gallon tanks. So what we did is we, we just, if you use just gravity to fill your tank, you kind of have to position the tank by the downspout. But if you use atmospheric pressure, you can kind of put it everywhere you want because you can fill the tank from the bottom up. That's what we did. So uh, in the picture in the upper right, that's the pipes coming into the tank. And then you can see the sight glass. Uh, a friend of mine helped me design this. That way we can tell how much water is in the tank. And then the very tight, uh, very, the pipe on the horizontal on the very top is used for overflow. So we, we wanted, um, we have, we needed about 4,700 gallons to, Lisa, could you get the dog, please? Um, we, we, um, back up here. We needed about 4,700 gallons of water and how you figure that can be found in the article. So if you've got two 2,000 gallon tanks, what do we put the extra 700? Well, we have a stock tank, as you can see in the picture in this lower center. So as that overflows, it fills that stock tank. We can use a stock tank for trees and so forth. And plus we get, sometimes we get late summer water to replenish the tanks. Anyway, last year, all the water we needed, including some garden plants, was still at about 200 gallons left. If you look at the picture in the lower right, you can see that's the second tank, not a great picture of it, I know. And you can see how it's connected to the primary tank. Uh, the tank is exactly the same size and exactly the same height. So when they fill up, I know exactly how much water we've got in the tanks by that sight glass on the primary tank. And you can see the pipe that was that's connected underground between the two tanks. And those are our raspberries in the raised bed in the left-hand picture coming over the trellis there and some of the early plantings. The question is you might want to ask yourself is how long does it take to fill two 2,000 gallon tanks? And the answer is, about two days. <laughs> so we had to have, I thought I did the math wrong when I first calculated the square footage of the roof of the barn. Um, and, but no, it, it's really, really quick. So I had to have a robust overflow system and that's exactly what you see in the stock tank. When the water overflows, uh, it just falls harmlessly on the ground like it would if it was coming off the roof. So if you look at the barn itself in the, in the center picture, you can see, an, uh, on the left side, there's also one on the right side, the harder to see. You can see that down, that pipe coming down off the, um, the gutter. That is, in fact, sealed. That's where you start the sealed system. As long as the tank is lower than that pipe, where, it, where the water enters off the gutter, then it will fill from the bottom up. Anyway, um, and then one, uh, one last comment about on the right lower picture. Eventually, I cover those pipes up with the uh, green covered basin you can see there. Then I put the uh, second water basin over that and I fill that up for the uh, goats chicken watering system in the center time. Uh, one of the a, a very important thing is to consider is uh, freeze protection. I mean, you've got to be very careful here. What we do is we just use the tank up uh, in the summer, then in the fall, we just drain the underwater we drain the pipes that are underground and it's kind of hard to see, but in the upper picture, 
you can see that small green base in there with the lid. There's a little valve in there that runs off there. I just open that valve up and drain the, the uh, pipes out and then we'll freeze protected. Next slide, please. We also do rainwater collection for our pollinator pond. And you might say, what's different between a pond and just a reg pollinator pond and a regular pond? The um, invertebrates have to be able to land on something and kind of work their way to the water. So it's kind of like the swimming pool effect where they're trapped in there and can't fly out. So this pond is filled exclusively by um, rainwater collected from the roof. I was able to design the gutter system on the roof to capture about 60%. And this is strictly gravity. It comes off uh, down into a downspout, goes into a pipe, interconnecting pipe system and comes out um, below water level there. One of the things we do here is we have as many water plants as we can in there. <clears throat> it helps to, um, it helps with evaporation. When I first designed this system, I thought this is it's going to evaporate all summer. We don't get a lot of rain up here in August and July, but it turns out <laughs> that it's almost uh, almost no supplemental water. But just in case it needed some, I did put an interconnecting pipe from the faucet that the hose connects into and, and it can refill that tank. But it turns out I, I only think I've had to put supplemental water in there twice in 15, 20 minutes each. So it's worked out really well. We do have a lot of um, frogs that have come in. I believe the species is the tree frog. Uh, they sit on the lily pads and, and croak up a storm. It's a coffee that sometimes keeps you up at night, but it's one of those things that's really wonderful to hear. The rocks all around it are uh, covering up the plastic to hold the water in. And uh, I've seen dragonflies and I've seen bees uh, land on the rocks and get a drink of water and fly away happily. And the main picture on the right, you can see to the left of that, where the stones are, that's where the overflow um, brings the overflow water all the way back to the back of the property. Very important, otherwise it would just flood because it's been filled in, in absolutely no time at all. On the picture on the left, you can see some of the one in, in uh, summer, you can see how much of the, some of the uh, water plants fill the surface of the uh, pond itself, helping with evaporation. Next picture, please. We do have a couple of special projects. We're always trying different things. One of them, start with the picture on the right. That's, this is separated from the pollinator garden. What I wanted to try was something that was just 100% native plants and see how it did with little human intervention. So it's about 1,200 square feet. I dug it all up. I brought in 15 yards of topsoil, and there must have been Canada thistle seeds in there because. I have taken out at least 500 mature Canada thistle plants, and I planted several species of um, native plants. Mostly, I've got them from the uh, North uh, Northwest Meadowscapes, great source for native seeds. It, I will give it probably a C to a C minus in how it's doing. I did water it for the first year with sprinkle hose running right out there. The narrow leaf loop and the riverbank loop, and were the two that took off the most. Uh, the, not, the native grasses made their way in, even though I dug down uh, almost two feet to get rid of all the bracken fern rhizomes and then to get rid of all the non-native grass roots. And then I dug a, a perimeter all the way around this and put in uh, about eight inch deep barrier so that the blackberries and the native grasses couldn't get back in. Well, they made their way back in through wind and whatever. Um, I have pretty much left it alone. I would say it's not doing great. I think the only thing that will survive probably is the lupin. Um, I, I guess I did do a little bit of intervention. I had to go and pull the Canada thistle, but that's all that I did. Uh, and I'm still convinced that the seeds came in from, with the soil. I just couldn't have gotten that many in one place. On the left, you can see um, Osmia, of course, is the, the name for the mason bee and then Bombus genus for bumblebee. I built these houses to specifications, <clears throat> which you can easily find on the internet. Uh, the logs that I use in the center section are from an old uh, sequoia that I, I planted many, many years ago, fell down in a windstorm. I cut it up into pieces and drilled the holes to specification. And you may be the blue orchard mason bees, very common here. It's the real workhorse of the pollinator world for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's a solitary bee. And um, it's really funny when I finished um, drilling the holes in the juniper that you can see, 
I put up the green fence to keep the woodpeckers out. And the mason bees came almost immediately and they genuinely seemed irritated that I wasn't moving out of the way quicker so they could get to their uh, new nesting site. And I actually, you can't see it, but at the very bottom of that, I actually keep a little bit of um, mud. The, the mason bee, of course, gets its name because it goes about six inches, burrows about six inches in, which those were drilled. I drilled those six inches down with, with the right radius. And uh, they lay their eggs out and they, they separate the eggs with um, mud, mason bee. And they usually do five female eggs and one male egg at the very end, the, in case the woodpeckers come in, they get the male and not the females. But that's, that's a little green fence I put up there. I haven't seen a woodpecker uh, bother these at all and been very successful. The uh, sequoia that is standing on the left of that picture, I drill holes specifically for the leafcutter bee, which has got a little bit different dimensions. Haven't seen any in there, uh, but they, they have habitat should they ever decide to visit. In terms of bombus, the bumblebee, there are several ground dwelling bumblebees in the area. I'd love to have one. Haven't seen one yet. What, my fear was that what we would get in there was uh, wasps or something or yellow jackets, but uh, nobody's really in, interested in it at all. And we have, that's also the base, by the way, for the uh, test beds. We've also planted several different types of flowers in there. So it acts like a natural habitat for them. Uh, next slide. So how do you keep track of all this? I know everybody here um, has their own method of doing it, but it's been really important because we follow the Xerces guidelines, kind of want to know what works and doesn't. So this is an example of our 2023 list. Now, over the years, these lists are getting smaller and hopefully by 20, 2025 or something, it'll be down to almost nothing. The changes will have been made. Everything seems to be working. But uh, because we want to not only do we want to tailor to the pollinators, but we also want to make sure it looks good for people, secondary. Make sure the plants are, are layered right, the large stuff in the back and so forth. So you can see some of the plants that I've picked up. Um, if you take the very the um, part of the spreadsheet, this is a Google spreadsheet that I got for free, I believe. Works amazingly well. I order, uh, received and implanted them is what those three letters stand for. I always put the scientific name in to make sure I know what I'm talking about. In this case, it's foam flower. If you have it latched on to foam flower, it's just a great sh shade loving plant. Does really well. Great for pollinators, good color um, and uh, so forth. So anyway, I'm obviously uh, you need to keep track of what we're doing. And this, this really, really helps. You know, a lot of times I'll order plants and they don't get delivered until the spring. And so this helps me know what I do and don't have. We've planted well over 400 species of plants, not at any, you wouldn't find 400 different species at any given time, but over the seven or eight years we've been here, it's been over 400 species. Some haven't worked, uh, some have, some have taken over and some had to be, you know, cut back a little bit, but Goodyear Farms is a, a nursery that's very close to here. It, um, they specialize in native plants. Uh, the Owners are very knowledgeable and very helpful. North Best Meadowscapes, I mentioned earlier, they're up in Washington. They're a great source of information for native seeds. And then what I like about Blue Stone Perennials is if you have to order online, um, they're, they're by choice because they're, first of all, their pots are uh, compostable. You just put the pots on the ground, it's no plastic. And they seem to have a real sense of, we wanna to try to make this work for, um, people as well as the pollinators. So those are my go-to uh, companies. Sometimes I can't find it. I have to go somewhere else, but generally that's where I get my plants from. Next slide. So Lisa and I like to share the experience. Um, one of our favorite things to do is when kids come, we have trinkets, little, little things all throughout the garden. And the hardest one to find is the wooden red mushroom with the white dots, but eventually kids come across it because it's really fun when the kids get here and say, oh, I didn't see that last time. And we're going to have a fourth grader class from Portland come on this spring when the garden's in bloom or part of the garden's in bloom. Uh, and, the, and the only rule is you kind of have to stay in the walkways. The kids do pretty good with that. We also have a hobby farm. The kids can experience that. And uh, you can see the chickens in the upper right-hand corner. I came home one day, we had roosters, and there was 20-some chicks with one hen running all around. So I made sure they had a good supply of food and water and a heat lamp in there. And uh, it was kind of fun. And we have three goats to our picture there. 
Um, and you can see in the uh, photograph in the far left, the SKEP, S-K-E-P, it's in, on the pole. It's what they used to use originally bee houses before the modern beehive evolved. Um, we are, I'm not in the business of uh, running a beehive, but if, uh, if any honeybees or any other insect wants to make a home up there, they're more than welcome to do it. It's protected from the weather, but yet still accessible enough, and the bees have an entrance in the bottom. You can see some garden art in that same picture. And uh, some plants in the center picture that are uh, really, really good for pollinators. Next picture, please. Talked a little bit about the Clark County Cans Conservation District. They came by and did a masterful job of taking the culvert out for us and planting some native plants in the wetland down there. Talked a little bit about uh, deferment of the property. The second lot, eight and a half acres, is totally dedicated to wildlife. And uh, it's on a timber management plan. Now you do have to eventually harvest this timber, but you're given 99 years to do it. So it's a great plan. Lisa and I have been in the natural garden tour two years now. One year was COVID, so it was done virtually, but last year it was, uh, we had about 120, 120 people or so that showed up. We're also active in the Clark County uh, Adopt the Road program. <clears throat> now after four, let's see, five years of doing that program, they finally said that the road's too dangerous. It always was too dangerous and it should never have been on there in the first place. So I kind of go out there myself and just do it unofficially. Uh, I'm also on the Ivy League, where we, um, we remove uh, invasive English ivy from a lot of our parks. We usually meet, uh, oh, I don't know, probably eight or nine times a year. And then I mentioned the do-it-yourself water collection system with Grit Magazine, which is all the details you'd ever want to know about our water collection system with the two tanks and how much you're going to need for your size of garden and so far, all those details are in there. And I, I wrote a paper on the, for Master Gardeners, Longster Gardens. I believe it's still available through the Master Gardener program, but if not, I can certainly get it to anybody who may want uh, to have it. And um, any, any other information about this presentation, you, you may want. This picture here, you say, why this picture? It looks like it's kind of one of the older ones, and it is, but it's my favorite because this is the time of year when winter is starting to wane and the new plants are starting to come up. And I know we're all anxious to get out there and get our hands dirty again. And you can see the rain and the plants flourishing and their vivid greens and the nodding onions and um, so forth. So um, just a wonderful time out here. You can see some of the forest we have in the background. Next slide. Uh, I guess Erica, I have a few minutes, um, and on the last, not this slide, but on the, some of the topics on the left that we've talked about as a reminder, and I also want to say on the, when we get to the last slide that my email address and I believe phone number are there, but if you have any questions, um, as Meg said, I'm a retired electrical engineer, and I, so I know solar inside and out, I, not only the theoretical, but as well as the practical and what you can really expect. A lot of the state incentives are gone. I don't know if they'll be back, but the federal incentives are getting a little bit better. I think they're at 30%. So please, any questions about solar or anything else you've seen in this presentation, please don't hesitate to ask. Erica? Yeah, so um, if folks wanna go ahead and put questions in the chat box, I'll go ahead and relay those to Jim. Um, one that did uh, show up in the chat box was a question asking where you sourced your juniper. Right, so there's a company in Portland that specifically works with a sustainability effort going out in Eastern Oregon. And I believe they're called, <laughs> if, if you search the internet for uh, juniper lumber in Portland, it will come up, I believe it's Northwest Lumber, but um, they, they will deliver, um, it's, it's heavy. And I'll tell you after, it's, they've been in the ground, those things have been in the ground now for eight years and are just like as solid as the day I put them in. I believe it's Northwest Lumber, it's right in Portland. And the, what happened over in Eastern Washington very briefly is they, um, when they when they harvested some of the conifers, the juniper took over, even though it's native to the area. So they, they wanted to rebalance it. And in, in the rebalancing effort, they started cutting the juniper down and, um, but letting it grow back to its natural state. And so all that cut down lumber has been re repurposed to the 
people who want to use it. It's, it is a little bit more pricey, but well worth it. Portland in Portland. Right. So nor Northwest Lumber. I, I believe that's the name of it. Yeah, I think it is too. Um, another question has come in and it's, how did you remove the English holly trees? Uh, <laughs> So what great question. What what I do is I, I cut the female trees down because you might know this that the uh, holly trees have a female and a male. The females have the berries, the red berries, which are really pretty, and everybody likes making a wreath out of them at Christmas. But they're the ones that spread the seeds and the birds like. Uh, so I cut them down and just let them lie there, and then I group them, and clump them up, and, and use it as habitat for animals. But just cut them at the base. Is it, was that the question, Eric? How do I cut them down? How do you get rid of the holly? Yeah, so. The English I just cut it down, but my main effort is after the females, the berry producing plants, and cut them down and uh, let them lie, and then eventually put them in the stacks and let, let the animals use them as habitat. Uh, and then the follow-up question to that is, won't they re-sprout? So if you if you cut holly, will it not re-sprout? Well, it, 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 it does, in fact, so you got to kind of go around and keep after it. Um, I don't think a, a down tree would be sprout. I don't think that at all. But I do think if you, if, if you don't dig the, uh, tr which I think of the question is, if you don't uh, dig the trunk out and the roots out, it will be sprout. I believe that is true. And I keep after it. Right. Thank you. And then um, there's another question asking which solar company you used? a and r And um, they are a really good company. One thing I like about them so much is, you know, I, when employees come out and work on something for me, I always ask, how do you like the company? And if this shows how they treat their people, that's important to Lisa and I. And a and &R just gets A plus every time. Um, they come out, they do the entire assessment. You really don't need people like me anymore because they come out, do the assessment, tell you what, what happened, and they're really, really accurate. And then do the work, and, and, uh, and then they back their work. If you don't generate as much as they said they would, they reimburse you. Uh, and then all, they also, if you have any problems or anything, they're there to, to get you through them. So A, A and R Solar, I believe it stands for Andy and Reed, which are the two founders. Hey, I'm not they, saying, go ahead. They're based, uh, their main office is in Seattle, but they have, they, got so much, they have so much business that they have a sub office in Portland. I want to point out, if I could, um, that's why me on the left, uh, why me is in charge of management and supervision. And that's Mr. Rose, who's in charge of the planning department. He's thinking about next year very carefully there. And uh, the good looking brown eyed beauty next to me is Lisa. <laughs> very nice. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat box. Um, we do thank you for taking us a uh, on a tour of your property. And I do hope folks will come out and see you during the natural garden tour. And Meg, did you have anything to say in closing? Meg, are you able sorry, to- Sorry, I was muted. Um, <laughs> takes a second to get there. No, I don't have anything further to add except to uh, thank Jim for this beautiful presentation, wonderful pictures, full of fascinating material. I really feel like there's room for a lot of other uh, topic exploration from this. I appreciate the time and effort you've put into it. And I'm Most grateful, to, grateful to all of you who attended. Great. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Good night.